So we're here at the Tota Theater in Farmington, New Mexico with the one and only Chishba. And another random five questions with Uncle Gonzo. Here we go. Uncle Gonzo is in the house. This is when you know you've made it when Uncle Gonzo interviews you. <laughs> My top bottom brother. What's up? Right. <laughs> I'll just jump right into the questions, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, question number one: How does how does a show like this um, come together? And the background of uh, every every entertainer you got, and on your part, how, how does this show come together? Okay, so I'll try to put it into a quick sum. So how it comes together is years, 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 years. Like uh, this set here. This is our second show here at Toe Top. This is taking about four to five years to get to this point. To get to this point, uh, building a good relationship with all the entertainers that are going to be on the stage, sharing the stage today, has taken about at least that four to five years. So this group that I'm getting ready to perform with on stage is a group I've known since day one. <laughs> Got to give a shout out shout to Fraser Fridays, day ones. Uh, they've been, they literally have been by day one since uh, four or five years ago and even previous. So, and that includes Ernest David Sissy. So, it was getting here was about networking, number one, collaborating, number two, being kind, humble. Um, humble meaning there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be more downs than ups. And on the ups, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to give praise and you're going to appreciate it. So, uh, the other is just um, just staying committed, 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 and there's a lot of sacrifices, uh, but commitment. And then the, uh, the entertainers that are coming through, I've known them, I've seen them, some of them are way younger than me, like for example, Jamar Hall, but I've watched him grow, I follow him on the things he does, he's been, you know, he's uh, born and raised from Shiprock, been in the cities, uh, he's recently been to bigger I mean, he lives in albuquerque but in the in the bigger cities for comedy joshua fournier i've just seen him blow up like in the last two years uh, especially with social media he's quick on his feet him and jamar they're both quick on their feet and just where they're at with their generation so it's amazing to see uh got to observe him doing a set here in um uh, the Bee Lounge here in farmington for a comedy show amazing set he did and for him for him to be able to uh, give me the opportunity as an audience to be able to relate to some of his stuff. That was that skills right there because I'm, you know, I would say I'm born in the 1900s and the early 70s. So for me to be able to relate to that and and get a lot of ha ha's out of me, I, I was like, dang, this, you know, he's good. So there's him. And then uh, Ephraim Yazi, I've known him since day one. Um, he's just been an amazing guy, an amazing comedian. Uh, really coming up on um, just coming out into the the city area, so I'm excited about him. Um, he's uh, just always been my day one too, and in fact, for this show, he's amazing because he was a huge contributor to this, almost sponsor too as well. 34%, I'm gonna say, well, about 60% um, of the show, but that was amazing because we would the show would not happen if it weren't for Ephraim. So he's really committed, really devoted to what he does, and I just. I uh, love his comedy because he just, um, you'll, you'll hear his comedy. He's got some crazy stuff out there. So, yeah. So, there's Ephraim and the Jenny Shea, a Zumba instructor I came across through Zumba. Uh, like I said, it's just all about who you come across, who you network with, who you collaborate with. Um, and she was actually a Zumba instructor. And she and I got to talking, got to know each other. And come to find out, she was like, I want to try comedy. I was like, hey, this is your opportunity. So, she's getting her opportunity today. So, I'm excited about that. Um, and I've seen her commitment with her Zumba, and I've seen how she flows, and she's determined about that to be able to stay loyal to something that she's got in mind. So that tells me that I look for character, and so I saw character in her. So I'm excited for her today. I'm very excited for her today. Um, and then, of course, we have Josh, I um, uh, said Joshua Fournier. And then we also have, of course, our amazing Ernest David Sosie the third. I mean, he's been like my lifelong... Uh, just mentor just oh my gosh i just like i say if i could say i graduated from a program of comedy he was my instructor oh my gosh just amazing and then we have eric treviso day one just amazing 
I love his bi, bi ethnic, biracial uh, comedy that he puts in. Um, in fact, him and Jamar do the exact same thing. So, hey, there's Jamar, one of the comedians coming through. Hi, Mrs. Hall. Hi. Congratulations. Hi, Mrs. <laughs> so it's always a comedy family. <laughs> I'm glad he made it to your wedding and didn't try to post the I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. I was gonna say I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to figure out your loyalty and commitment here. No, I was getting character counts around here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You better come to my show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyhow, so yeah, so it's a great lineup. I'm excited. I, I, did I answer? I tend, I tend to ramble. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, question number two. Okay. Being a parent, mm -hmm. how do you juggle things around from doing something like this to your work and being home for your children? I'm ADHD. <laughs> I'm attention deficit disorder. Uh, God has blessed me with multitasking and I have to multitask in order for me to stay sane. So um, my circles are always, there's like many circles going on at one time. If you ever look into the desert during the, during the windy days, especially that's where you see the little dancers, the little wind dancers, that's how my circle flows. And so each one of them is being a mom, being being a mom and a dad, uh, being a, you know, being a daughter, being a Uber driver, to being a delivery, you know, all this comedian, da, 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 whatever, and the work and everything. Um, it's just, it, it keeps my spirit alive, if, 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 and it helps me to discipline myself so I stay on track. So as much as it might be a, like, ah, for me, it actually is um, therapeutic. So it it feeds me. <laughs> I have to. Hey, baby girl, there's my baby. Talking about talking about mom. Here comes my baby. And this is how I do it because I have an amazing family. This is my baby girl, and, and this is my other daughter from another mother, and that's another. Yes, that's my sister. That's Mrs. That's Mrs. Treviso. <laughs> I'm her niece, but that's how we do it. I'm a comedy family. We look out for each other, and that's how we get it done. I mean, that's what I mean by networking, collaborating, and just working together and trusting each other with uh, who we've got. So, mm. okay. I put the, um, Emily, yeah. I put the box, that bag, it's right under the, oh, the, mic. Uh, the front. Oh, and then, and then Shanti, show her the cutter. Make sure you guys do the, the oh, yeah, yeah. tickets. And the, okay. okay. And yeah. the so that's how we do it. <laughs> All right. Question number three. Okay. Um, Favorite kind of, how, how do you like mutton fixed? Stew, roast mutton, over the open fire, oven. How, how do you like your mutton? Mutton, oh my gosh. I love mutton because I love to cook. So I love mutton. The way I like mutton is um, I like, well, the good meat, of course, every, every mutton's good meat. But I always know when people don't know how to clean their mutton. <laughs> your, your husband ate that. So you know you got when you're butchering, you got to make sure. That's why grandma's very strict. You don't put the meat on the ra, otherwise you can taste the the ra on the meat. So uh, that's the first thing is I, I and I have thankfully I've got family um, who've got uh, mutton, so they'll give us our mutton, and I like to uh, cut it up. There's two ways I like. One, I like it diced. So I'll dice it up. Um, if I don't have that much time, I'll fry it up real quick in a pan, uh, get it nice and fried, and then uh, get a nice hot water, hot boil water, and then put that in there, put the mutton in there. And then if we have um, fresh corn, I'll do white corn. My mom prefers white corn. I'll cut that up from the grocery store if there's if they've got white corn. Um, if not, if we have nesjiji, um, then if that would be the, not the, the, the next digi one, it would be if it's just recently, like now, you know, there's uh, steamed corn. So we usually go ahead and cut that up, peel that up, and we'll put that in there. So that's a quick way that I like that. But the other one I really love is, um, when it's boiled all night long. Oh, that's my favorite. When mm -hmm. the meat just falls apart. Oh, that's so good. And the corn, the white corn is, yeah, that's the bomb. <laughs> that's my favorite. With right. good fry bread. Oh, yeah. Right on. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, fourth question would be like traveling mm -hmm. from um, like doing um, opening acts like for, 40, say, 49 laughs uh -huh. and for the 
ladies of comedy mm -hmm. that that experience with um them type of uh, comedians how, how's that feeling when you get on the stage knowing that you're followed by all these um great comedians or i follow them yeah. that yeah I am, it's an honor. Number one, it's an honor. I tell you, um, because they, they have always been their mentors and, you know, other, other nationalities, other ethnicities have their circle of celebrities, their circle of whatever, you know. So when I'm within that circle, I feel like I'm like in a whole nother, like, wow, I can't believe, you know, just like my son said, you know, I can't believe you have James June's and Ernest David Sosie's phone number on your phone mom. <laughs> that's how I feel with them. Like, you know, like I'm like, that's Adrian Chalapa. That's Adrian Chalapa. You know, my moment with Adrian Chalapa was I remember um, I was sleeping in my living room and I, I sleep with the TV on with that, the ADD issue because I can't sleep well. So, and one day all of a sudden I heard a voice that sounded very familiar and I was like, what the heck? I opened my eyes and once you know there was Adrian Talapa on Lifetime on my TV uh, because there was a Bridezilla. There's an episode on her on Bridezilla and so she was on. I was like, that's Adrian Talapa! So to be in the same presence with her, it's just, it's mind blowing for me. And then of course all the other comedians. Um, you know, like Teresa and James Bilagodi and uh, Tatanka Means and just all of them. So when I'm in the, or when Tatanka Means is there, I'm like, I can't believe I got Tatanka Means, you know, and I'm all cool backstage with them or on stage, but in, in, on the inside, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to be all fangirl, like, give me your autograph, you know, so it's exciting. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Then the, my last final question uh -huh. is pertaining to our youth. Uh-huh. With um, what's going on in the world today, like with um, the trouble with uh, racism because of uh, an ignorant president we have, yeah. to um, issues of um, missing indigenous women, to um, stolen land and yeah. water rights and everything. How would um, our children and our future generation get involved in what's going on in the world? Okay. Pay attention, generation. Number one, get your education. That paper is very important. I have my paper in sociology and psychology. That doesn't really mean anything to this day. I've got to get my master's. So eventually, hopefully, when I got the money and the funds for it, I'm going to get that done. The purpose of that is not to be able to say you have bragging rights. But with that paper, I have learned, even in the community that I work in right now, with that paper, it gives you a bump up in it gives you validation as to what you say because it doesn't matter how much education you have sometimes you're going to be in a community uh where you're 0.001 percent native american or navajo and sometimes your voice will never be heard even you could have a title as a doctor your voice might not might not be heard but that paper somebody else will hear it and see that paper and see that commitment and that dedication and they'll take you seriously so that paper is very very important number two is as far as everything else goes I think the biggest thing is going to be learn how to advocate for yourself learn how to advocate for the others and the other is read do your research hey the man is in hey, the hey, house hey, 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 hey. Woo -hoo! Are okay. we yes so yeah, <laughs> fangirl <laughs> Start, yeah, I had your autograph again. <laughs> Starstruck. Start I know. That's it. That's, that, this, is, this is really the reason why I just so I can get autographs from all these celebrities. I really don't do comedy. I just talk a lot of noise, but that's the only way I can get photos with them. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, so. Ooh. But yeah, so almost I'll have the I'll have the numbers here for you guys. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know. So I know. I'm all like, oh. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, cool. Um, so uh oh, uh, so basically that would be it's just networking, collaborating, uh learning how to um just knowing your history. There's one thing about history. When I was working, I was about, I always say I'm an undergraduate. No, I'm a graduate school dropout. Uh, so I was going to get my master's in psychology or counseling. That's what I was going to do. And I was actually going to Western New Mexico University in Gallup. But I had to drop out because um, I had, I became a mom again. <laughs> I became a mom twice, like while I was doing my graduate school. 
<laughs> but anyhow, um, so I didn't have the time anymore and I couldn't travel back and forth because we recently moved here and ran out of money. So I'm giving those reasons because I don't want you to say, I just quit and graduate. No, there were so many factors that I had to consider that it was like, you know what, I can't do it. I can't do it right now. But anyhow, while I was studying to get my counselors, there's so much information out there that you never have, may have been exposed to. I wasn't exposed to, I wasn't taught. And that is just the generational uh, trauma that has gone from one phase of the government to another. Like the boarding school phase to the, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just kind of blow my mind. I hear footsteps, that's where the ADD puts in. <laughs> I know, right? Mm -hmm. This is not even the mic. This is the. You got two minutes. Hurry up. <laughs> Where's Eric? <laughs> Get out of the bathroom. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so it's the the transgenerational uh, that trauma that has gone on from the different phases. So we talk about the boarding school phase. We talk about the placement program. We talk about the assimilation phase. Some people don't even recognize that there's a phase called the assimilation phase, and that was in the 70s. That was the phase after the placement program and the boarding school. So those teachers had already gone through years of conditioning, um, and some of them, may, and there's different ways people think about it, but the way I think about it is the way I justify it and the way I've experienced it. And so it's, I see the phases and I'm like, dang, it really does kind of jack you up later on in life. So then there's the assimilation phase, and then of course there's the rest of the way. It, it, I will say I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed enough that the, the, the people that were my teachers or my educators went through the phase, but they were of my own people. You know, they're Navajo, so they still looked out for me because it's chill, and he had the whole tingle, which means they were very strict in teachers, and they taught us, but yet they were still family so i could trust them to be like it's cheating that they're still family so i they did that and they were there for me in that way that they helped me develop no just that that's how it goes oh no, no. i'm sorry my dog <laughs> the tickets oh yeah just leave it as is oh that's how you give it to them oh okay. oh okay yeah oh, oh. Okay, so there's that. See how I'm so ADD, I can go back to what I was talking about. So that phase, um, and that's a generation, I, I really want you guys to really do your own research. That's research you're not gonna find in a textbook. That's research you actually have to go into home sometimes, some of your relations. If you ask them about, you know, did you ever go to the boarding school phase? You're gonna hear some horrible stories and you're gonna hear some stories that say, it was there for me, it protected me, it got me out of bad situations, those are true. But you're gonna discover when you look back that there was a, almost a dysfunctional cycling effect. Um, because once you become a parent, you start to realize how conditioned you are. That's when I came into battle with myself, is when I became a parent and it, I, I learned the difference between unconditional love and conditional love. I learned the difference between being conditioned and then institutionalized, and I had to really go to battle with that. And that was the hardest, hardest, hardest battle, I think, to discover myself and be able to come, become the mother I needed to be for my child. And at that point, I realized my oldest son, who is now 22, is the first child in my family, my direct family, that did not get touched by the government, meaning he was able to live within the home and graduate from home without the government saying there's not a school here for you so you're going to have to go live in a dormitory you're going to have to move away from home but by the age of 14 and you're just going to have to pluck you out pluck you in and now you're living within a you know something similar to this with at the time strangers but they become they become my lifelong sisters and brothers that I've gotten to know at the residential home or the dormitory but I mean, those, that's information I want the young generation to become aware of and I want them to learn because the next phase is going to be proposals. Learn about proposals, grant proposals, take classes about grant proposals. There are so many people out there with the administrative roles and their corporate businesses. And I'm like, 
you didn't take a grant program class, did you? You didn't take a pro proposal writing, grant proposal writing class, did you? Because you're not understanding the steps uh, as to how to develop a program, how to facilitate it, how to continue to collaborate and network with other resources and for it to become something and build off of that. And then you pass that on to the next generation. That way we're not doing this. Let's reinvent the wheel. You know, that's nonsense. We're, we're in a new century. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, especially with social media. It's just because we just need to all stop being ignorant and becoming more educated. And that takes ourselves making that stance in that position to say, I'm going to figure out what the, what the heck is going on. What's this about? So anyway, that's, that's for the other. And the other is just pray, pray, pray every day for yourself first. For yourself first, because you are useless to everybody else if you can't pray for yourself and take care of yourself first. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Hey, can we keep